Matt Parker made a video recently where he measured the speed of a fidget spinner and he did it in a really interesting way. You can watch that video by clicking on the link in the information card or in the description. But it inspired me to make this video because I have a hunch that there is a physical principle at play stopping you from significantly improving your fidget spinner spin time. Some people buy fidget spinners because they like to have something to fiddle with in their hands. Some people buy them because they become obsessed with improving improving their spin times. How long does the thing spin for before it stops? Some people don't buy fidget spinners because they think they're stupid and pointless. I'm the second type of person, by the way. I like to try and get these things to spin for as long as possible. And you might think that if you whack the fidget spinner and you get a spin time of, say, four minutes and 40 seconds, then if you whack it twice as hard, so it's going twice as fast to begin with, then you'll get a spin time that is twice as long. I don't think that's the case because of something called exponential decay. I want to explain what exponential decay is and where it comes from and the effect that it has on your fidget spinner. But first, let's find out if I'm right. Matt's technique for measuring the speed of a fidget spinner is to analyze the sound coming from it, to look at the different frequencies that it produces when you spin it. And one of the frequencies coming from the fidget spinner corresponds to the frequency of the paddles moving past the microphone. You get a low hum from that frequency. To calculate the speed, you need to first calculate the number of turns per second. To do that, you divide the frequency by three. That's because the frequency coming from the app is telling you how many times the paddle passes per second, but there are three paddles in a full turn. So divide by three, you then multiply by the circumference, and that gives you the speed of the tip of your fidget spinner. These cheap fidget spinners like the type Matt used in his video produce a lot of extra unwanted sound from the noise of the bearing. So I spent a bit more money on my video than Matt was willing to on his and got this fidget spinner here. It spins very, very quietly. The only sound coming from it is the hum of the paddles passing over the microphone. This peak here is the frequency of the paddles passing the microphone and as you'd expect, it's slowly going down as the fidget spinner slows down. So I got a top frequency of 240 hertz, substantially higher than Matt Parker got. Though sadly, uh, the radius of my fidget spinner is smaller than Matt's, so ultimately my top speed is slightly under Matt's top speed. It's 15 meters per second or 54 kilometers per hour, very slightly under. That's not important though. What I'm interested in is how the speed changes over time. So I looked over that footage again and recorded how the frequency changes with time. I converted the frequency into speed and that gives us this lovely graph here. I think that's an exponential curve, exponential decay. So exponential decay is when you go along a fixed amount of time and the speed goes down by a half and then you go along the same fixed amount of time and the speed goes down by a half again. So every time you move a fixed amount of time, the speed halves. And in this case, it's 40 seconds. Every 40 seconds, the speed halves. So what does that mean for your fidget spinner spin time? Well, if I whack this pretty hard, I can get it going at 50 hertz and that will last for four minutes and 40 seconds or 280 seconds. So. If I whack it twice as hard, will it double the spin time? Well, we know from this graph, if I double the speed, then I only move along an extra 40 seconds. So doubling the initial speed, hitting it twice as hard, only adds 40 seconds to my spin time. So instead of doubling four minutes 40 to nine minutes 20, I just get an extra 40 seconds. I get five minutes 20. It's pretty 
rubbish when you look at it like that. And that's the problem with exponential decay. If I wanted this thing to spin for twice as long for an extra four minutes and 40 seconds, I would need to double the speed for every extra 40 seconds. And there are seven lots of 40 seconds in four minutes and 40 seconds. So I would need to double the initial speed seven times or two to the power seven. That's 128. So I would need to increase the initial speed by a factor of 128. In the case of this fidget spinner, that's 400 meters per second or a little bit over the speed of sound. So that's why it's hard to significantly improve your spin times. To double the spin time of this fidget spinner, you would need to break the sound barrier. Let's just take a look at that graph again and make sure it is an exponential decay because in Excel, you can do an exponential best fit analysis and it gives you this line here. It's actually not a perfect fit. So the curve that we have isn't perfectly an exponential decay. There's something else going on, but what is it? Well, before we look at what might be going on, let's look at why it is quite a close fit to an exponential decay and why I thought that would be the case to begin with. So, Exponential decay, or indeed exponential growth, arises from a particular situation. And the situation is this. If the acceleration or the deceleration is proportional to the speed, then you get exponential decay or exponential growth. And by proportional, what I mean is like, you know, when you double the speed, you double the acceleration. When you triple the speed, you triple the acceleration. In that situation, you get exponential decay or exponential growth. The reason I thought we would have exponential decay in this case is because I thought the deceleration would be proportional to the speed because deceleration comes from friction, the force of friction. So uh, force equals mass times acceleration. So force is proportional to acceleration. So if the force of friction is proportional to the speed, then we should have exponential decay. And we have equations to describe friction and how it works, but they're not laws of friction because friction is messy and complicated. They're models that work in different situations. So the model of friction that I was assuming to work in this case was the model of wet friction, where the force of friction is proportional to speed. So wet friction is the force you get when two objects are rubbing against each other, but they're lubricated in some way. And my assumption is that the bearing inside the fidget spinner is lubricated. So why don't we get a perfect exponential fit? It's because there's something else going on. I suspect it's drag. So I was kind of ignoring drag, thinking that the main component for the deceleration would be the force of friction in the bearings, but obviously drag is important as well. Drag force is proportional to the square of the speed. So how do you work out what the curve would be in that case? It's actually really hard to work out because it's an example of uh, non-linear differential equations, which are really hard to solve. But we at least know that if the deceleration is proportional to the square of the speed, then it's even worse than exponential decay. And that's what we seem to have here. One final thing for this video, I talked about the stroboscopic effect in passing in a previous video about gravitational waves, link in the description, but fidget spinners are a good example of the stroboscopic effect as well. If you film a fidget spinner, then you're taking frames of footage. And so if the thing is spinning round like this and your camera takes a frame of footage at that point, then takes another frame at that point, then takes another frame at that point, then another frame at that point like that, what are you seeing? Each frame looks like this. So it looks like the fidget spinner is frozen in time. But if the fidget spinner is going slightly faster than the frame rate of the camera, then it slowly appears to be turning in that direction. And then as it slows down, it will go in this direction and actually appear to turn backwards. So that's the stroboscopic effect, which you should be able to see quite nicely there. The other thing that your fidget spinner demonstrates nicely is the rolling shutter effect, which is an effect of the sensor in your camera. So when your camera takes a frame of footage, it doesn't do it simultaneously for the whole image. It scans down the sensor. So if the fidget spinner is spinning around as the sensor scans, it's going to smear out the paddle so it seems wider than it is.
So there you go, that's why you can't substantially improve the spin time of your fidget spinner. I actually made two videos this week. The first you're watching now. The second one is unlisted, so you won't see it in your subscription feed. It won't appear in my list of videos. If you want to watch that video, you have to click on the link in the description or in the end card. That's the only way to see it. So it's not about science. It's about YouTube and kind of what I'm up to. So if you're interested in what I'm up to, uh, check out that video and I'll see you over there.